We're glad you're here with us today. We're glad those of you who are watching by Facebook have joined us. And uh, we just hope that you'll stay with us and that we'll, you'll watch the entire show. It's not a show, it's a sermon. But anyway, uh, you can call it a show if that makes you feel better. <laughs> We're going to be talking today about the letter to the church at Pergamos. We'll be in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 12, starting with there and right, reading down to verse 17. So uh, we'll be reading in the New American Standard Bible. It may be a little bit different than the Bible that you've got in your hand. I know some of you got King James, some of you got NIV, some of you's got New King James. You might have the NLT or you might have something else. And they'll all read pretty much the same. It's all going to get to the same place. Revelation chapter 2, and verse 12, And to the angel of the church of Pergamum write, The one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name, and did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who, uh, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idol, and commit acts of immorality. So you also have some who in the same way hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the, my, with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna. I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. This is God's Word. Heavenly Father, we pray today that you will speak through us. We pray, Father, that the teaching from the church of Pergamum our Pergamos would uh, infiltrate us. Father, give, our, give each one here and those who are watching by Facebook their own personal message through this message that we're delivering today. Make it personal to each person who hears. And Father, may their attention be drawn to what it is that you want to say to uh, to me and to each one here. Thank you, Lord, for the, your word. Thank you, Father, that you are a loving God who loves us even when we are unlovely. You love us even before you um, sent your son to die for us, you loved us. You knew us before your son came to die on this earth. You knew ever sin that we would commit before your son died on the cross, you hung the whole sin of the whole world on your son as he died on the cross. And Father, we praise you for providing the perfect sacrifice for our sin, something that we couldn't even do for ourselves. We thank you, Father, for Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who presented himself to the cross and laid his life down in order that we could have eternal life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you did on our behalf. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the stripes that you bore for us that were our stripes, but you took them. Thank you for the beating Thank you for the ridicule that you took, the ridicule that should have been ours. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving my soul. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all of the ones who have gone before me and will come after me who trust in you for their salvation. Thank you, Father, for those who will hear this message, who will, their faith will be strengthened in Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, we ask all of this in your precious name. Amen. Someone asked concerning the so-called church federation scream, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if all the churches united and we simply just had a great organization? All could agree to accept a common creed so worded that everyone could subscribe to it, and to the shame of Christendom's divisions would be ended. Now, why not support something like that? Would not this be the fulfillment of the prayer of our Lord, that they may all be one? John 17, 21, I might be caught by such a proposal, but in the book of Revelation, I learned that just a, a religious federation is going to arise after the church uh, of God. This religious federation will arise there will be a one world government, there will be a one world church, and they will all believe what they want to believe, but they won't be believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to consider when we think that it would be great for all of the churches to just come together and we would write something in that document to bring us together that we could all agree with. Unfortunately, there are things that other churches believe that we cannot believe, we cannot accept. There are some churches who teach that there are other ways to heaven. There are a lot of evangelicals who actually believe there are many ways to heaven. We have the words of our Lord Jesus Christ that says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Now that is a pretty narrow approach, and I'm glad to say that I believe that approach. I'm happy to say that I've followed that way. Jesus said that their broad is the way that leads to destruction, and narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. And we need to get what, what Jesus had to say when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. There's background history of Pergamos. We need to look at that. The early history is obscure. There are evidences that it was occupied during the Stone and Bronze Age uh, prior to Alexander the Great. Pergamos was little more than a castle on top of a hill. Pergamos has been said that it was... Uh, Let me see if I can find my notes here. I've lost. Anyway, uh, Pergamos, as Jesus said, it's where Satan's seat is. So we need to watch. The church of Pergamos was in a, a bad place. Satan is real. God said, and Jesus Christ said in the book of Revelation, Pergamum is where Satan's seat is. And if Jesus said Satan's seat is there, then Satan is surely real. He is real in character. He is a murderer. John 8, 44 says that Satan is a murderer. He is a deceiver. Revelation 12, 9 and 2 Corinthians 11, 3. The John 8, 44 says that Satan is a liar. And 1 John 3, 8, he's a sinner. Satan is real in his character, and he's real in his domain. He's a vast demonic kingdom. That's what he has in Matthew 25, 41. It's a world system, 1 John 5, 19. It's local. It's not omnipresent. Satan cannot be all places at all times. Satan has demons to do his bidding and to do his work. Satan oftentimes 
as most of the time is in heaven accusing you and me before God for the ungodly things that we have done because we all mess up. In fact, our mess up is called sin. It's called something that's more than just a mess up. We want to say, well, he is, he's got a disease. He's an alcoholic. It's just a disease. He can't help himself. Well, I've got news for you. Alcoholism is sin. And there's a cure for it. And the cure for alcoholism is Jesus Christ. There's the cure for drugs is Jesus Christ. We either choose to walk in the world or we choose to walk in Jesus Christ. But we're going to see that the church of Pergamum had one foot in both worlds. And that's what we as Christians often do. We get one foot in church and one foot in the world. We have no record as to who the Antipas was referred to in verse 13, but his name means against all. Many years after the Council of Nicaea, the Arian party was again largely dominant. And Theseus, that uh, doughty old champion of the truth, was summoned before Arian, the emperor of Thessalonians. He demanded that uh, Athens Asias cease his oppression or opposition to the teaching of Arius, who was long since dead, and admit that the Arians to the table of the Lord. He reproved him. And he said, don't you realize that all the world is against you? Can we realize that as Christians today, that the world is against us? The world wants us out of the way, though we are an inconvenience to the world. Our doctrines that come from the Word of God goes and flies in the face of the world. It causes the world to have to look at the, themselves and say, hmm, I probably shouldn't have done that. When they, what they really want to do is look at uh, themselves and say, boy, didn't we have a good time doing that? The world does not want to be face to face with their conviction of sin. That's why the first thing they holler at us is if we quote a Bible verse, is you're judging me. That's the very first thing they go to. You're judging me. They, people don't want to be judged for their sin. People don't want to say, well, that was sin. That's wrong. Homosexuals don't want to hear the word that they're sinners. They don't want to know that their lifestyle goes against God. They say that if we say anything about it, you're a homophobe. You're judging me. I've got news for you. It's sin. And if you don't accept Jesus Christ, you're going to bust hell wide open. That's just as fear as plain and simple as that can be. So he stood against the world, and they killed him. Listen, fear not who, him who can kill the body, but fear him who can kill both the body and the soul and put you in hell fire. I'm here to tell you this morning, do not fear the world. Even if they kill you and you are a born-again Christian, all they did is give you a promotion into heaven. Amen. All they did is took you out of a life of misery and put you into a life of blessedness, a place where Jesus Christ is. Because the scripture says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So we need to understand that. But Jesus said, I have a concern for you, the church at Pergamos. He says, I have a few things against thee because thou hast them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and commit fornication. 
so hast them also that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So we look at the first thing that Balak did. You know, Balak took his pretty women who were loose, who uh, approached their, the gods that they worshipped, and he took these loose, beautiful women that were probably not dressed too, uh, too good, and he, he got them to camp around the, the, the Israelites. And the Israelite men were, you know, men are stimulated by visual of what they see. And I'm sure these women were giving them plenty of stimulation because Balak had told them to. So the first thing you know, these women began to take the Israelites and pull them out of camp. And not only did they pull them out of camp, they began to pull them into their church, their way of thinking, their way of doing things. You know, women still do that. Women are still getting godly young men and pulling them out of church. They're still taking, you know, godly young women get pulled out by ungodly young men. Missionary dating is a bad idea. I don't support missionary dating. If we're going to be dating somebody, why are you going to date somebody if you don't intend to marry somebody? The whole purpose of dating is to find a mate. And if you're just dating and dating and dating and dating, you're not looking for a mate. You're looking for something else. So if we're going to date somebody, don't date a, a lost person. If you're saved, find somebody that's saved. Well, the saved ones aren't pretty enough. That's a lie from the devil. Well, he's just not got enough six-pack. Uh, I can't see his ribs. You don't need to see his ribs. You need to see his spirit. You don't, you don't need to see the body. You need to see what's inside the body, that it's hidden, the hidden man of the heart. You need to see the, the woman. You need to see the hidden woman that's in there. A woman should be so hidden in God that, that God has to reveal her to a man. A man should be so hidden in God that God has to reveal him to a woman. When it's that way, it works. Missionary dating, bad, bad practice. Well, that's what Balak told the women to do. Go out. And, and entice these men to come into you and then take them down to your temple and you worship in your temple. You drag the men out of the camp and you cause them to just, they just look at you and they lock eyes with you and they're just under your spell. Satan works that way. If you are dating somebody and you can't stand it without them, if you can't make it through the day without them, there's something wrong with that. That is a spirit that has entered you through them. So these women got these men to worship in idols. Not only that, they were committing fornication with them. And that, my friend, was bad. Worshiping an idol is committing fornication on God. We need to understand that. And listen, what is an idol? An idol is anything you put before God. Anything that keeps you from being where God tells you to be. Anything that keeps you from doing what God has called you to do. Anything that you put ahead of God is an idol. This TV, if it's not used right, is an idol. Your new car, 
if it's not used right, it's an idol. If it keeps you out of church, if it keeps you from do doing what God wants you to do, it's an idol. If, if food is your idol, you'd rather eat than go to church. Anything can be your idol. Your spouse can be your idol. Your spouse, if your spouse or your girlfriend keeps you out of church and you got to be with her, you look, I got to go to the lake. Man, we're going to go out. If summer is almost over and the water is still warm and we're going to the lake, we're going to water ski and we're going to take our fishing poles and we're going to fish and we're going to have a big time. We're going to drink beer. We're going to just put on a big party. And we're going to miss church. Not even going to worry about church. What's church? If that's what you do, that's your idol. If it's hunting, if, look, I've heard a lot of guys say, I can worship God out in the woods just as good as I can worship God in church. Well, I'm telling you what, if you're in the woods on Sunday morning, deer hunting, Deer hunting is your idol. I'm sorry to have to tell you that, but I'm not going to flinch a bit when I say it. If you think that you can worship God the same way out in the woods as that you can here in church, you have fooled yourself. You have believed a lie. Besides that, when you get in the woods, you're likely to most not even have God cross your mind. Don't believe a lie. Sounds good to hear somebody say that. When they say it, it always sounds good to them. That's an idol. Anything you put ahead of God is an idol. For some people, your job is an idol if you don't go to church on Sunday. Now, I know that a lot of people are going, man, that's going to raise some hair. That's going to stir some trouble. But if you put your job ahead of God, it's an idol to you. Because really what you're doing is you're putting the money that you can make on your job ahead of God. And money can be an idol. The prophet Balaam, we now turn and consider another uh, thing here. Balaam taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the sons of Israel. Numbers 25.1. Let me just read it to you. While Israel remained at Shittim, the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab, for they invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel joined themselves to Baal of Peor, and the Lord was angry against Israel. The Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of the people and execute them in broad daylight before the Lord, so that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. God said, kill them. So Moses said to the judges of Israel, each of you slay his men who have joined themselves to Baal of Peor. Then behold, one of the sons of Israel came and brought to his relatives a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses, in the sight of all the congregation, out of the sons of Israel, and while they were weeping at the doorway of the tent of meeting. The people of God were weeping in the doorway of the tent of the meeting. And here this Israelite boy brings a Midianite woman and parades her right in front of them. And it says, uh, When Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest saw it, he arose from the midst of the congregation. He took a spear in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and pierced both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through the body. So the plague of the, on the sons of Israel was checked. Those who died by the plague were 24,000. Let me ask you something. How did he spear both of them at one time? Could very well be 
let you figure that out. In this is a union of the church and the world. And this figure is a union of the church and the world. Our churches today have one foot in God's camp and one foot in the world. Churches today won't stand up and preach on homosexuality. Churches today won't stand up and preach on missionary dating. Churches today won't stand up and say the word of God is true and every word of it is true and we should live by it. Churches today won't talk or preach on hell. Churches today won't stand up and talk about the Word of God. Churches today won't stand up and tell you that if you're going to go after other gods, if you're going to go after all the other idols in your life, that you are going in a bad direction. Churches today want to get up and they want to give a nice little sermonette for the Christianette so they can go outside and smoke their cigarette. And I'll preach on cigarettes, too. Amen? I used to chew tobacco, and I laid it down because God said lay it down. And I did it. I laid it down. It ain't picked back up. Drugs are a sin. Tobacco sin. Alcohol sin. Hunting on Sunday morning instead of being in church is a sin. I'm sorry. All you people here that like to hunt, if you hear this, you're probably not going to be happy with me. I didn't come here to make you happy. I came here to make the Lord happy. I came here to give the Word of God. Churches today are full of compromise. They compromise everything coming and going. We've got churches doing Christian yoga. Lord, help us. Yoga is anything but Christian. Constantine's patronage did what Diocletian's persecution could not do. It corrupted the church. The, the rulers, you know, we're better off when the rulers are totally against the church. We don't like for us to be under persecution, but we're better off under persecution because it purifies the church. And Diocletian couldn't stop the church, but Constantine patronage, he recognized the church. And he did more to harm the church because then he opened up for the leaders of the church to come and sit on thrones at his place. So we got the church now. We uh, This is what started. Oh, here's another one of those bad things. You know, there's a, a church out there that has people who they think has the word of God and anything they say is what God says. started from Constantine. Just as soon as the church listened to the suggestions of the enemy coming now in the guise of a friend and has given her fair hand to the world, it has a, a, a misaligned, and she's misaligned with the world, at once her testimony has been annulled. When we as people when we as individuals get one foot in the world and we start, man, this is so good, you know, I'm just out here, man, I'm, uh, I've got all this stuff I'm doing on Sunday and, and on uh, other, other times, man, I'm doing this and I'm making money, I'm having fun, and I'm getting everything I want to get totally ruins your testimony. When we align with the world, when we start looking like the world, smelling like the world, talking like the world, and acting like the world, our testimony is gone. Nicolaitanism was designated as a distinct system of teaching. It was during that period that the clergy was accepted as of divine origin. There's something, therefore, uh, something that must be bowed down to. Look, we don't, y'all don't bow down to me. I don't want it. I don't need it. I don't expect it. If you do, we're both going to be in trouble. I don't want anybody bowing down to me. Do not call anybody rabbi. 
for the one is your teacher, you are all brothers. I'm a preacher. You don't call me any special name. Don't call me rabbi. Don't call me teacher. Call me brother. Don't call any man your father. Don't call any man father and as he is your the person you bow down to to listen to all spiritual authority. Paul said his he had his son Timothy. Paul was teaching Timothy. Paul had Timothy was a son to Paul. But not Timothy didn't say, Well, Father Paul. He looked at Paul as his uh, teacher, as one whom was uh, his mentor to teach him how to do. He didn't call him Father Paul. We don't call any man Father. However, if I want to call my real daddy father, that's okay. Because I'm calling him father as my daddy, not as my spiritual superior. In fact, the scripture says in different places, some of the men of the Bible talk to their father, their daddy, their papa. There's only one leader that we have, and that's Jesus Christ. He is our superior. He is the one who leads us and guides us. The greatest, the scripture says, the greatest among you should be the servant to all. So if you are a servant to everybody and you're doing things for other people, you are a servant and that makes you great in Jesus' eyes. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. The last shall be first, and the first shall be last. He who would be great among you, let him be the servant to all. There is a promise to the overcomer. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in the, the stone a new name written, which no man knows, saving he that receives it. There's a promise to the overcomers, the ones who persevere, the ones who skip deer hunting to be in church, the ones who puts everything else on hold to be at the house of God, because the scripture says to forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is. There was the ones who overcome will get to, to have the manna. There's a warning to all churches. Antipas had felt the sword of Rome, but the church at Pergamos would feel the sword of Christ. Difference. It's a difference between the, the sword of Rome and the sword of Christ. The word, Hebrews 4.12, if they did not repent, this is not a reference to our Lord's return, but to a present judgment that comes to a church when it is disobedient to the word of God. Churches, as well as individuals, need to be obedient to the word of God. The Lord had presented himself as he which had the sharp sword. So the church could not have been ignorant of its danger. <clears throat> Remember, we are in a time where people have said, oh no, don't read the book of Revelation. Get out of that book. Don't read that book. That book will scare you to death. You can't understand it if you do read it. The book of Revelation is the only book of the Bible that we are promised a blessing if we read it and heed it. 
got to read it, and we got to heed it. Seven churches has got a powerful message. If we can't find ourselves in these seven churches, <coughs> you know what I'm saying? Ephesus was a church that had lost its devotion. They had, they had their doctrine, but they lost their devotion. Smyrna was a church to endure persecution. Pergamos was to purify and have ambassadorship. We're to stand fast against the world personal level, in our own personal level. Ephesus is a church that the, where the people neglected their priorities. In the church of Smyrna, uh, the, the people had satanic opposition. In Pergamos, there was spiritual compromise. Strengthen, purify your ambassadorship accurately. Represent your king. There's a promise to the overcomer. In the church of Ephesus, they get to eat of the tree of life. In the church of Smyrna, they're not hurt of the second death. In the church of Pergamos, they get to eat the manna, they get a stone, and they get a new name. As with the previous churches, the closing appeal is to the individual. He that hath an ear, let him hear. To him that overcometh. God fed the Israelites with manna during their wilderness travels, and the pot of manna was placed in the Ark of the Covenant. Instead of eating things sacrificed to idol, believers in Pergamos needed to feast on God's holy food. The bread of life found in Jesus Christ through the Word. We need to get in the Word. If we're spending more time watching television than we are looking at the Word of God, we might need to rethink our priorities. Are we praying when we read the, the Word of God? Or do we just read the Word of God and we got our three chapters read and, and we don't know what we read and read it? I've been there and I have done that. I confess. I've read a whole chapter in the Word of God and didn't have a clue what I read. And God shakes me when I do that, and I have to go back and sit down and read it. I have to check myself. God checks myself. We need to be in the Word of God, and it needs to be meaningful. <clears throat> the Ark of the Covenant was the throne of God. The Ark of the Covenant was found in a tent of meeting. There is a throne of God right here in this tent of meeting. Let me say that again. There is the, th the throne of God can be found right here in this tent of meeting at Bethel Church. There is a throne to God right here. If we, ha if we don't have a throne to God here, we're not a church. We need, we better be having a throne to God here. There better be a portal to heaven. There better be a place where prayers have, can be prayed and God hears and we touch heaven. We absolutely have to have that. We need that. Don't be unwilling to be here. 2 Samuel 6.10, And David was unwilling to move the ark of the, the Lord into the city of David with him. He took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Thus the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And God took, or David took notice of the fact that Obed-Edom was getting blessed coming in and going out. If you want to be blessed coming in and going out, you need to be found where God wants you to be found. Amen? Should be found in the house of God. Should be found in the Word of God. Should be found on our knees praying to God. The blessings of God will follow the tent of the meeting. 
wherever the, the children of Israel pulled the stakes up and carried all the tent of meeting, the tabernacle in the wilderness, wherever they carried it. And the next place they set it up, God was there. Until as long as we meet here in our home, the tent of meeting is right here. God will be here. God will show up. When we come to worship Him, God will be here amongst us. Where two or more are gathered together in my name, I will be in the midst of them. When we gather together in the name of Jesus Christ to worship Him, God will be here with us every time. Every time. He promised it. As it was pointed out to us this morning, not only are we here, but there's more angels here in this room than we could possibly dream. If God was to open our eyes and we could see the angels around us, we'd probably duck because they, we'd probably be seeing that they would fill this entire room, be jam-packed, running over, pressed down, shaking together. In contrast to Satan's throne, which is held authority in Pergamos, they had one foot in the world and one foot in the church of Jesus Christ. We've already talked about we need to quit living like the world, talking like the world, looking like the world, smelling like the world, and wanting what the world has. <clears throat> There's an exhortation. Repent, or I will come unto thee quickly, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. That is a warning. That is a warning to me, and it's a warning to everybody. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. I don't know about you, but I don't want Jesus fighting me with the sword of his mouth. There is something about him coming back. <laughs> <laughs> on a white horse and there's something about the sword coming out of his mouth and there's something about the whole army that's against him just gets killed so quick that the blood runs bridle deep on the horses. And that's a whole lot of people really quick and that's a whole lot of blood all at once. In those days, a white stone was put into a vessel by the judge to vote for acquittal for a person on trial. It was also used like a ticket to gain admission to a feast. Both would certainly apply to the believer in a spiritual sense. He had been declared righteous through faith in Christ, his feast with Christ today, and will feast with him in glory. The stone is precious. And there's going to be a name that we get that's known to us and us alone. Who is the overcomer? You know, I've heard all my life. Those who persevere will go to heaven. Those who hang on will be going to heaven. Those who are overcomers will go to heaven. Well, who are the overcomers? 1 John 5, 4, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. 1 John 5, 5, Who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and you have put your faith in Him, you are an overcomer. And you're the ones who hangs on until the end. You're the overcomer. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you are the overcomer. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. That's Revelation 2, 7, 2, 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. 217, who has an, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna. 
I will give him a white stone and a new name written on that stone with no man knows but he who receives it. There's four or five more verses that I could read about the overcomers in the book of Revelation. Those of us who believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that Jesus Christ died on a cross for us, are overcomers. He who has an ear, let him hear, <clears throat> lest Jesus comes to you quickly and fights against you with the sword of his mouth. God has spoken to all of us, I'm sure. We all, if we're not careful, we all can find ourselves with one foot in the world and one foot in church. Every one of us can do that. It's so easy. We are so indoctrined by the world that we, there are things in the Bible that just blow us away when we really see the truth of the Word of God and we hear what the Word of God really says. It blows us away. We can't understand. We're so full of the world. The world is so far away from the Word of God that we can be thinking that we're doing fine and look up and suddenly see that we're in, got one foot in the world and one foot in the church. It happens to all of us. And God loves us. And Jesus loved you so much and he loved me so much that he died on the cross and paid for our sin debt. <clears throat> he that believeth on the Son hath life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. <clears throat> For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. <clears throat> if you find out, that, if you see this morning that you've got one foot in the world, when you thought you were doing okay, 1 John 1 says, and verse 9 says, For whoso, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. But he says, if we say we have no sin, we are a liar. And the truth is not in us. We all have to come and find out that here's something I've been doing and I didn't know was wrong. We have to take that to the Lord and we have to confess it and say, Lord Jesus, I didn't, reckon, I didn't realize this, but I found myself guilty of sin. And it is sin, and I confess it is sin, and I'm ready to turn away from it. I'm ready to look at this the way you would have me to look at it. I'm ready to behave the way that you would want me to behave. Amen? Where are you at this morning? <clears throat> what are you thinking? What is God saying to you? What is it that God showed us this, today? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you. We ask you to forgive us and to cleanse us. Father, you help us to have a heart like David. Have a heart that pants after God. Help us, Lord, to see our sins honestly. Help us to be honest with you about it. Help us to not be deceived by Satan. And help us to not deceive ourselves. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. O oh, Lord Jesus. Help us today. Father, we pray for somebody that's watching by Facebook that hasn't trusted in Jesus Christ. We pray for somebody that's watching by Facebook that's trusted in Jesus Christ, but you have spoken to their lives today about something that's in their life. 
<clears throat> Father, we pray in Jesus' name that you would speak to hearts, that you would bring conviction, that you would set us on the right path. Father, that you would forgive our sins and hear our prayers. And Father, we trust you and we love you and we praise you and we thank you, Jesus Christ, for paying for our sin debt. <clears throat> Lord God, help us to be found in your word. Help us to be found faithful. Oh, Lord God, speak to those who you love, who need your guidance. Speak to those whom you love kindly and gently and tenderly. Lord, help us to softly and tenderly walk in your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Cut it off.